again. Kevin Inoue here from Fight Designer LLC. This camera's a little crooked. Neep, neep. Hang on. Is that better or better? Try this again. Hi, and welcome to another PewTube. Uh, I'm uh, not as on top of these things this summer as I maybe should be, but I've got a lot of other fires in the iron as it were. Iron's in the fire. Iron's in the fire. Been a long day. Uh, artist meeting at Cleveland uh, Public Theater this morning, rehearsal with Domama Theater at Cleveland Playhouse and Playhouse Square for a theater festival with a stage manager who's also someone I know from their shows at Karamu because I've been working on my fourth show with them now. I'm kind of all over the place, but the main thing is working on this book. Uh, those of you who don't know, I'm working on my second book right now with Focal Press. My first one being the Theatrical Firearms Handbook and my current project being the Screen Combat Handbook. So specifically for putting fight scenes on camera. Um, kind of taking what a lot of the intro to stage combat kind of texts that are out there do for theatrical combat and trying to do something like that for uh, film stunts, but also adding in how do you shoot it, how do you edit it, how do you design for it, a lot of the other stuff that's more specific to camera work and video work. Um, so it's, it's a big project and I'm a little behind contract and I'm working my butt off to try and get it done. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, I did get into new toys and uh, so that gives me a little something to talk about on PewTube. I still want to do some other interviews and things when I have time. But uh, yeah, that, that list of, uh, I'll do that when I have time, it's a long list right now, so, so don't hold your breath on any of this, and if I don't get an episode out a week, uh, just know that it's because I've probably got other more pressing matters to do. PewTube does not pay, PewTube is not uh, directly related to any of my career paths in terms of leading to, nor, to more work or anything like that yet, at least, still relatively new. Um, so this is just kind of something I'm doing as an experiment. If it is something you appreciate, let me know. Uh, if you can think of any brilliant ways to, to, I don't know, monetize or make this worth my time, awesome. But at the moment, this is small enough. Not enough people care. Um, so I'll do it when I can. You're welcome. All right, so new toys. First one here is a little bit of an oddity. Uh, I realized at some point that I don't have any of the Derringers, the little 22 Derringers. And the standard one of these uh, is this little, uh, sort of top break, uh, 22, single shotty kind of deal. Uh, a lot of folks who know this one. Um, I've worked with them before. I've had them at, at schools where I worked before. I've never actually owned one. Um, for that matter, I've never had anybody ask to rent one, so it didn't seem like that big a deal, but, you know, I figured, yeah, I teach workshops. Maybe it would be useful to have one for teaching purposes, at least, something like that. Um, and so I saw one pop up on eBay that was actually a different brand. I was like, oh, I don't know that one. I'll give it a shot. Uh, and this is kind of interesting. So this is the Winley Derringer. And this is not the same as the, the typical break action that we're all used to that I think is a, is it a Keymar? I think it's a Keymar. Um, it's obviously made to look about the same, but you can tell right off the bat the, the hammer is a little bit different. And when I actually got it, it's, it's interesting. The body here is mostly plastic. You can kind of see from the front, it's got uh, sort of metal liners, two-piece stamp-shaped metal liners kind of stuck in there just to help protect the plastic. But the exterior body is mostly this cheap plastic. Um, <laughs> now, the, the brake action one also feels kind of cheap when I've used it before. That's part of why I've never bothered to get one. They seem like they'd wear out pretty quick. They were kind of pieces of crap. Um, so, you know, I was like, oh, this is a different brand. We'll give it a shot. Whatever. It was cheap. It was eBay. Who knows? Um, but this is something I have not seen before. And in this one, you take it to half cock, and then this thing, which in the, the, the brake action one would be sort of the, the catch, you'd lift this up and then the barrels would hinge forward and allow you to load the 22 rounds in the front. This just comes out. So this is essentially a breech loading uh, mechanism of sorts, right? So this, this whole thing just pulls out and you can put your little 22 crimp blanks in there and then drop it back in and it lines up with those metal reinforced barrels. There's also a little uh, little divider splitter in there just as a safety mechanism so nobody could do something stupid like try and shoot short 22 actual rounds in there. And then you can cock the hammer back the rest of the way until it stops there. And then you can fire it. Now dry firing a 22 is a bad idea because they have uh, rather than a firing pin they have this direct wedge built into the hammer. Uh, and I've seen some 
uh, I put some pictures up in the book where they got mashed up really badly. So I, I don't like to dry fire these to, to test them. Um, I'm going to lower the hammer in a controlled manner, but uh, but you get the idea. Um, so when the hammer is down, this part cannot come out. When the hammer is all the way back, this part can come out. Um, and you can see now the, the wedge of the, the firing, firing wedge for the 22 there. Um, but it also has this sort of half cock position here that you can use to load it where it probably wouldn't go up, go off if uh, the hammer got pulled. So this is interesting. Um, I'm not sure that it's any better or worse, frankly, than the, the, the normally found break action um, 22 Derringer. Um, it's a front vent, which is conceivably better for film than the, the top vent that I think that other one is. Um, although you, you can kind of tell that the barrels are molded two-piece crap from the front there. I'd have to try and fill that in aesthetically a little bit better if we were ever going to see that, that front view there. Um, but what interests me this, first of all, it's just novel. It's different. Um, and also this mechanism, if I could be... I mean, this, this is fairly easy to make. Something like this would be pretty darn easy to make. Um, and so for a while now, I've been playing with the how would I build a blank firing mechanism that I could build into other props that aren't available in blank firing. Um, so like the, the um, Benai Anderson musket that I, I had to build a new stock for that's in a, a previous episode. Um, you know, muzzle loaders, if you want to do a match lock for your uh, musketeers. Um, if you want to build it into a shotgun, because you know, blank firing shotguns out there that aren't actual shotguns firing blanks, which you can't use in school campuses and things. Um, stuff like that. And, and so I'm always interested when I see other ways of doing it, other types of mechanisms, um, because it'd be fairly easy to have this type of action be built in as a part of the miming, you know, priming a, a flash pan, for example, or putting a primer on and, and tamping things down for a, a, a muzzle loading musket of some sort. And it's a fairly simple to build mechanism there, more so than a break action or something like that. Um, so, you know, it just kind of has me thinking, just brainstorming. Um, I haven't test tried this, to be frank, and right now I've got sleeping people upstairs, so I'm not going to right now, but maybe sometime I will. Certainly before I rent it, anyway. So the other new item I got is uh, a, sort of a duplicate. This is another of the APS M870s. I, I have one of these with a full wood stock. If you watch one of my previous videos about specifically the sound of a pump action shotgun, and I was comparing some of those between the APS and the Marozin, some of the non-shell ejecting versions, things like that. Um, so I thought uh, this actually gives me a bit more of a direct comparison specifically to the Marozin that I had, uh, but I thought it might be good to take the chance now, while I have this, to compare some of these versions, uh, both, both on looks as well as on sound and feel, and just kind of see how they stack up. So I have here, first off, the two most direct comparisons which include the APS and the old uh, Marazin Wingmaster. Now, the, the first most obvious difference is just the barrel length. The, uh, the Marazin has this uh, shorter barrel. Um, I'm not sure how big a deal that is, and for that matter, these might be interchangeable. I'm kind of curious now. Well, oh, no, that one's pinned. Okay, so I couldn't just swap out barrels. <laughs> the, uh, the Mara's end would make it a little harder to swap out barrels because it looks like there's a, a pin here holding it in. <clears throat> um, but in terms of, of feel, they are very, very similar. In terms of weight, you can see some differences here. Uh, and, you know, polished versus painted black and whatnot. But for the most part, very similar. Uh, they're obviously trying to be basically the same thing. Uh, the, the 870 Wingmaster. Neither has full trademarks. Um, but both are extremely similar, um, and they, they both function fairly well. Uh, these are both shell ejecting models. Now one difference is in the, in the shells itself. So the, the main thing that I don't like about these Mars and shell ejecting versions is that the shells they use only come in blue, which is a, a traditionally non-gun color, so it, it marks them as being not real firearms, which is not something that we want for theater and film. Um, yeah, you can paint them, but it'll chip off a little bit. Yeah, you could probably 3D print new ones. Uh, I, I, don't I don't know. There's there's probably ways, I just haven't gotten around it yet, and I've yet to find these in any color other than the blue. So I have Marozens both in the, the 870 and the uh, uh, Remington 1100, which is a semi-automatic gas model. 
Um, because it's a gas system and it's in a kind of an antique collector's item at this point, it's a little less reliable. Uh, the nice thing about the pump action is that unless it like physically breaks, it'll still work because you can always pump it. Um, so yeah, my main objection with these is just that the shells are a little bit smaller and that they're the wrong color. But the sound is actually pretty good. It ejects just fine, feels just fine, the size is pretty good. So, you know, as, as, uh, as these go, um, and this was the first of the shell ejecting shotguns that I got, and I was pretty excited about it when I got it. Um, will I use it now as much as some of these others? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Um, but uh, the main advantage I see of the, the APS, um, besides the fact that it's a little easier to get parts for because it's a more recent version, is just that the shells are better. So by way of comparison, here's the Marazen shell, and here's the APS shell. They're pretty close to the same size, but not exactly. The APS is a little thicker, which makes it a little closer to an actual 12 gauge. Um, but the main difference, and they also come in different colors and things, the main difference is just that these are only available in this blue, whereas these are available in a variety of different colors. Um, when you buy them, because these actually hold the gas, you get, they, they, uh, they can be expensive, um, but you get the actual crimps and papers and things like that, uh, a little wadding. So it's a much more realistic shell when you actually rig it up, um, which can be nice. And compare that also to the PPS shotgun shell, which is almost exactly the same size as the APS and comes in this orange color as its default, which is better than the blue, but not quite as nice as the red. Um, I have seen these available in like anodized aluminum finishes and some other kind of weird things. Um, nothing great. I don't really like the, the smooth finish in this bright orange. It just looks a little tacky, a little odd. But it's a heck of a lot better than this. But for shells, I would say the APS wins, hands down, in terms of realistic shell casings to go sticking out. Um, so we have back to back in terms of sound now. And because it does affect the sound, I'll include cycling one in the sound. We have the APS. And we have, still remove the orange tip from this one, the PPS. Oh, which is sticking a little bit. That's no good. This might be points off for the PPS if it's not going to have smooth loading. There we go. That works. Huh. There we go. All right. And of course we have the real deal. Yeah, it can't be the sound of steel. Just in terms of aesthetics now, we have the, uh, the Marazen PPS and APS, all looking very similar in terms of the receivers, uh, the furniture, the barrels, um, all very, very similar. Not a whole lot of difference there, to be frank. Um, and then we have the real steel. Now, frankly, any one of these is an excellent replica, if you ask me. Um, obviously, I still have to uh, take off the orange from the barrel of the PPS. I'll clean that up a little bit. The uh, rail mount that I got on this one is also a little bit off, um, but it's not bad. Um, it's got that nice quick detach sling mount built into that mount there. Um, any of these, frankly, are great. Some of the replicas that I have, uh, some of the non-firing ones, I've had things break like these, these metal bars here. So, you know, one question is just whether or not it's sturdy and also whether or not you can replace the parts. And this is really one of the problems that I've had historically with uh, different shell ejecting models is that they tend to not make them for very long. Uh, a lot of them end up becoming collector's editions. Those Marazen ones, I, I, I don't see those anymore. The uh, gas shell ejecting, uh, P-75s, 1911s, I never got one of the Glocks, sadly. Um, that, uh, the the shell-ejecting airsoft pistols that were out two, three years ago. 
they're gone. You know, occasionally I'll see a magazine pop up on eBay, but the, the real ones, you know, maybe once or twice a year for like 400 bucks, which is another issue, you know? When, when something becomes more of a collector's item, is it still usable as a prop? What do I do for deposit? You know, if someone breaks it, I can't replace it. How do I, how do I use that? How do I evaluate that? How do I, uh, how do I charge for that? Um, can I find parts for any of these? So this is one of the, the interesting kind of side notes that comes up if you get into props rentals or you know just starting a props collection. Um, you know, this also comes up with the model guns like the KSC M93R that I showed in a previous video. Um, a lot of the model guns are now collector's items and, and uh, harder to find parts for, if at all. Um, and it's not like the blank firing guns where you can still just buy a new one and they don't sell parts and so you just replace it. But if it's something you can't get, like, you know, even one of the, the rarer blank firing guns, like the, the Zoraki 917s, that, uh, the, the sort of Glock copies that nobody in the U.S. sells anymore. Um, you know, I recently tried to buy some more of those from overseas and custom seized it. I was able to get my money back for the props, but I did not get all of my money back for the shipping. And this is the risk that you take if you try and order stuff from overseas, even if it's stuff that is legal in this country. Um, you know, let alone if you try and order something that, that you're not sure, like the, the suppressors that work with blind guns. I haven't gone there yet. <laughs> but even if it's something you know is legal in this country, it might get seized by customs and you might never see it. You might never get your money back. Um, so when you have these rare items, it becomes a challenge. It's cool to be able to offer something that a lot of other props houses can't offer, including these shell ejecting replica shotguns that are, are relatively rare. You know, the, the PPS and the APS are still sometimes found. A lot of places are now we're out of stock on them, and I imagine they're probably going to come become collector's uh, items as well in not too long, um, like the, the Marshine did. Um, you know, it's cool to be able to offer that, and there are places, people who, who, who need that for their production. Um, but it, it is a challenge, because you, you can't put an easy value on it, you can't replace it, you can't fix it. People will say, hey, will you sell it? And I have to decide, like, you know, maybe no, because I can't replace it. But then on the other hand, if someone rents it and then loses it or breaks it, or just keeps it, and they pay the deposit, basically I am saying I'll sell it. Um, but maybe I just put a really high deposit on it. So if I am going to sell it, I'm going to sell it for a good price because I can't get another. Um, yeah, these are some of the challenges you run into with, with some of these more exotic items. So something to think about. Um, both if you are in this business yourself, I know we've got a couple of fans on the Theatrical Firearms book page on Facebook and, and on YouTube who are in this business as well. Um, and I, I welcome my, my peers in that sense. Um, but also if you're a client and you're having to decide, hey, do I want to rent that exotic prop knowing that I'm responsible for replacing it if it goes wrong and it can't be replaced, so that might get expensive. Just something else to throw out there. Um, so I do try to make sure that my clients know about these things when I rent them. Uh, I am upfront about the replacement costs that's in the contract, it's in the paperwork. Um, but these are all these are all things that you have to consider. If you are a client and you're receiving the paperwork and you're looking at the credit card deposit form for the charges you might be responsible for if things disappear, get broken, never come back, uh, it's like, well, why is the deposit for this blank firing Glock 17 um, you know, twice as much as the deposit for this blank firing bread in 92, they shouldn't be different. It's the same brand. It's the same build quality. Well, the answer is because one of those I can replace and the other I can't because they're not being imported anymore. Um, <clears throat> so these are some of the considerations that you need to think about when you're, when you're renting props. <clears throat> so uh, I need to get back to my book. <laughs> I need to get back to some of this stuff. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and call it a night. But, uh, oh, hi. Yes, hi, Tibble. Sorry, my cat's helping out. You want to say hi? You want to say hi? You want to say hi to the camera? No? He's a professional. Never look at the camera. So, until next time, play safe, look good, have fun. Uh, and uh, it might be a little more in a week till I get around to the next one, but I'll do it when I can. And uh, thank you for subscribing, liking, sharing, commenting, requesting content or information. Always good to hear from folks. Uh, I know we had some new people added after I got a little shout out from the uh, New York City Summer Sling Workshop that I'll be teaching at in August um, and a couple other places. So uh, if you're new, welcome, subscribe, say hi, and uh, yeah, till next time, this is Kevin Inouye from Fight Designer LLC.